Well, Tommy spent several days making a, a small boat to play with in the water. When it was finally ready for its maiden voyage, he carried it to the edge of a stream near his house. Well, when he got to the edge of the stream, he carefully placed his little boat, the little boat he lovingly made in the water, and he slowly let out the string that he'd attached to it, and he was so proud as he watched the, the toy boat he had made kind of sailing smoothly along in the stream. And he sat down in the warm sunshine along the stream's bank, admiring the boat that he'd built. But suddenly, as he watched, a stronger current in the stream caught his boat. And he tried to pull it back to shore with the string that was attached to it, but the string wasn't really all that strong, and it caught on a rock, and it broke. And the little boat, now caught in a strong current, raced downstream. Thank you. So his boat got away from him. Tommy ran along the edge of the stream as fast as he could, but his boat was moving downstream faster than his little legs could run, and soon it vanished from sight. He searched for his boat. He walked up and down the stream all day long, but to no avail. When it was too dark to look any longer, he walked home with his head down, filled with disappointment. A few days later, as he walked home from school, he was walking through town, and he spotted a boat just like his in a store window. He ran over to the window and peered inside and in, into the window and he saw to his amazement that it was the boat that he had made. He ran into the store and excitedly told the manager, Sir, that's, that's my boat in your window. I made it. The store manager said, I'm sorry, son, but someone else brought it in this morning. If you want it, you'll have to buy it. Tommy ran home and counted out all of his money. It took every penny that he had, but he was able to buy back the little boat he had made. As he left the store, he hugged that boat that he'd lovingly made to his chest and now found again. He hugged it to his chest and said, now you're twice mine. And he kept saying it over and over again, you're twice mine. When, it's, when he got home, his dad overheard him and he asked, Tommy, why do you keep saying you're twice mine? And Tommy said, Daddy, it's twice mine. It's mine first because I made it with my own hands. And it's mine twice because I bought it back. To whom do we belong? Are we first and foremost children of God? Or are we first and foremost Americans? Republicans or Democrats or Independents? To whom do we owe our allegiance? As Jesus teaches in the temple courts, a group of Jewish leaders approach him and they ask him a question. It isn't an honest question though. They don't really care how he answers. It's a question that they've spent some time shaping and they've designed it to get him to say something that will get him in trouble with someone. And they think they've got the perfect question. Because in their minds, no matter how he answers, <clears throat> and they've kind of framed it as a yes or no question, no matter how he answers, he's going to make someone very, very angry. On the surface, it seems to be a question about paying taxes. But Jesus sees through their trap, refuses to answer it in a yes or no way, and takes his answer much, much deeper. Turn with me to Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came to him and said to him, Teacher, now they're buttering him up. You know, it's when your people are trying to trick you, you know, they, they butter him up first. We know that you are true. And you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. They don't actually think that, by the way. And then they ask, Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? 
But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, and this is kind of in an exasperated tone, why do you put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one, and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Should we pay Caesar's taxes or not? Seems like a simple enough question, except that it isn't. First of all, look at the groups of people involved in this trick question. Mark says they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians. The Pharisees and the Herodians, two groups of people who couldn't be more different. The Pharisees were ultra-conservative. And as we've seen, they, were very, they had a very legalistic understanding of the law of God. But they were really popular with the common people. Even those who couldn't live up to the standards of the Pharisees, they admired them for their ability to so closely follow the law of God. And the Pharisees hated the fact that the Jewish people lived under Roman rule. So they were kind of heroes of the common folk. The Herodians were the aristocracy. You see, there were two levels of authority in the Roman Empire. The first was the Roman structure, right? Pilate was the Roman governor over Judea in the time of Jesus. Only Pilate could institute the death penalty, and anything that involved Rome's claim over Judea was handled by Pilate. He oversaw the military that was there to keep peace. He put down uprisings, and they happened on a regular basis. He was the Roman authority there under Caesar. Herod was the man who ruled over Judea as a kind of a puppet king. He wasn't actually a Jew. He was a Jumean. But issues that were just kind of uniquely Jewish concerns that didn't need to involve Rome, they were, they were handled by Herod. It kind of made, it was supposed to make the Jews feel like one of their own was actually an authority over them, kind of under Pilate. Now, as their name implies, the Herodians were either members of Herod's royal family or they were a member of his royal court or related to someone who was close to him. They accepted Roman rule because they benefited from it. And they sought to capitalize by getting close to those with influence and power for political and material gain, for wealth and power. We know, actually, that Tiberius Caesar, who was Caesar at this time, and Herod, who was one of the sons of Herod the Great, they had actually played together as children at a royal school in Rome. So the Herodians didn't place much stock in the law of God. And they didn't typically have a lot of respect for the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the God-fearing, ultra-conservative, legalistic people. The Herodians were more secular, more liberal. These two groups of people didn't have a lot to say about one another that was good. But here they come together to question Jesus, united by a common disdain for him and a desire to get rid of him. So when Jesus sees some Pharisees and Herodians together, walking up together to question him, he knows something's up. It'd be like seeing Kamala Harris and Donald Trump walking up together hand in hand to question you. What in the world is going on here? Now there were three taxes that the Romans required the Jews to pay. The first was a ground tax, kind of like a property tax. And each man had to pay to the government, because remember, they were a lot of them were <coughs> farmers. They had to pay one-tenth of their grain and one-fifth of the oil and wine that they produced. That was the ground tax. It was a tax on what their ground produced. The second tax was an income tax. One percent, <laughs> wouldn't we kill for that, <laughs> of each person's income. I think they'd probably all rise up if they knew yeah, we paid like 33 to 50 percent. The third tax was what was known as a poll tax. 
every male between the ages of 14 and 65 and every female from the ages of 12 to 75 had to pay one denarius, roughly one day's wages each year, simply for existing. It was the poll tax. And the tax that they're questioning Jesus about is that poll tax, that one denarius. And it was, again, the equivalent of one day's wage a year. The Jews resented that tax. Not because, just because, like, we all hate taxes, but because many, for many of them, God was the only true king. And to pay taxes to an earthly king was to admit the validity of his kingship. And in their eyes, then they would be insulting God. The Jewish zealots, who were even more conservative and even more radical than the Pharisees, and they were much more militant and they were much more prone to violent up uprisings against Rome, they refused to pay the tax altogether. Because in paying it, they saw themselves as acknowledging Caesar's dominion over them. Now, people didn't openly uh, identify as zealots, by the way, because Rome was trying to hunt them out and kind of get them out. That was dangerous, but they were more of an underground type of movement. One of Jesus' disciples was a former zealot, by the way. Simon the Zealot. So they didn't even pay the tax. And therefore, they were in hiding a lot. The Pharisees, they resented the humiliation implied in paying the tax, the humiliation of being dominated by Rome, but they found a way to justify paying the tax because they didn't want to deal with reprisals from Rome. So they paid it even though they resented it. The Herodians actually supported paying the tax in principle. They had, they had no problem with it. And this is where things got sticky for Jesus. Because if he says, yes, pay Caesar's poll tax, the masses of people, many of whom hated, most of whom hated the tax, they would turn against him. And he would lose his following, and he would lose his influence, and he would be discredited in the eyes of the people. And if he said, no, don't pay the tax, that would be seen as kind of like a, the beginning stages of an uprising against Rome. Like another Galilean, a man named Simon the Galilean had done just a few years earlier, and it resulted in his imprisonment and, and, and later to be death, put down as an uprising. So he would look just like, he, you know, and, and Simon came from Galilee, there was Judas the, or Simon the Galilean, uh, and, or Judas the Galilean, and then there was Jesus the Galilean, and he was going to follow in this Judas the Galilean's footsteps. And he'd garner the attention of Rome, and it's likely he would be viewed as a rabble-rouser and hold off in chains to prevent an uprising. So in their mind, they had him. No matter how he answered, he was done. But instead of answering the question, Jesus asked for a denarius, the coin used to pay the poll tax. And when they found one and brought it to him, he asked them a simple question. Whose likeness and inscription is this? You see, on the front of Tiberius's denarius was his image, along with the words, Tiberius Caesar, August son of the divine Augustus. On the back of the coin was the image of a female on a throne, wearing a crown, holding a spear in one hand, and either a palm or olive branch, we can't really tell which, in the other, and the words high priest were inscribed there. Now, the Romans believed that Caesar Augustus, father of Tiberius Caesar, and the Roman ruler when Jesus was born, was a god. And therefore, Tiberius Caesar was the son of a god. And thus divine, or at least partly divine himself. Now, possessing this coin didn't mean that someone was worshiping Caesar, but it did mean they were acknowledging his authority over them. And Jesus didn't question their, his authority. He simply said the coin has Caesar's image and inscription on it. It belongs to him. Pay to Caesar what belongs to him. Now Jesus doesn't fully flesh out a theology of the relationship between po politics and theology, church and state here. Morris taught about that in other parts of the Old Testament. Among those things is the acknowledgement that human authorities are granted their authority by God, whether we agree with them or not. 
and therefore they're to be respected, whether we agree with them or not. In the early church, for example, Christians benefited from the Roman roads. The Roman system of roads enabled the gospel to spread quickly for that day throughout the empire. And the relative peace and security that Rome brought into the world through their military, especially protection along the roads as people traveled, uh, you know, because they really sought to curtail bandits and roads, uh, along the roads, even though, you know, I mean, with only horses and men on foot, they couldn't do that perfectly. But the Roman transportation system and the protection provided by people on it led to the gospel saturating the empire in one generation. So the... And the basic principle was, if you benefit from the government's programs and institutions, pay the government's taxes honestly. He says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Have any of you read the book Freakonomics? It's a fascinating book by economist Stephen Levitt that turns kind of conventional wisdom on its head. On the subject of cheating, specifically cheating on taxes, but cheating in general, Levitt calls it the pro a prominent feature in just about every human endeavor. We cheat. We cheat in sports profusely. You get money and trophies involved and people start cheating, even at the high school level. Athletes not academically eligible who can, we, we, we cheat to win. It's what we do, right? Now, although he doesn't declare it part of human nature, he does note the prevalence of cheating among ordinary people like school teachers and wait staff and payroll managers. And while evidence for cheating is often hard to uncover, at times it's overwhelming. You see, back in 1987, one spring evening at midnight in 1987, seven million American children suddenly disappeared. Was, the word, was it the worst kidnapping wave in history? Nope. It was the night of April 15th, which is what? <laughs> Tax day. And the IRS had just changed a rule. Instead of merely listing the name of your independent children, As of April 15, 1987, tax filers were now required to provide their Social Security number too. And immediately, seven million so-called U.S. children disappeared from the tax rolls overnight. Seven million children who never existed, who were being claimed by their parents on tax documents. Seven million. Children who had existed only as phantom exemptions on the previous year's 1040 forms, they vanished. That's one in 10 dependent children in the United States at a time, at that time. 10% of the children the U.S. thought they had did not exist. Parents made them up to get tax credits. Think some of those fake children existed on the tax returns of people who claim to follow Jesus? I think it's pretty likely. Give to Caesar, he says, what belongs to Caesar. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on, and to God, the things that are God's. The Tiberius Denarius, that coin that was used to pay the poll tax in Judea. It bore the image of Tiberius Caesar, and therefore it belonged to him. And then he says, but pay to God the things that are God's. Who or what bears the image of God? Certainly not a coin. Like I said, Jesus takes this issue deeper than taxes. You see, you and I bear the image of God. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. He's holding an image of Caesar. Yeah, this, this bears his image, his likeness, his inscription. Pay it to him. But if there's something that has the image of God on it, 
Give that to God. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens <coughs> and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Every human being who has ever lived, the good and the bad, Mother Teresa and Adolf Hitler, every human being belongs to God. Why? Because just as the Tiberius Denarius bore his image and therefore belonged to him, you and I and every human being who has ever lived bear the image of God and therefore we belong to him. You whether you follow Jesus or not, you bear his image. And those of us who follow Jesus, we are twice his. Once because he made us in his image and twice because he bought us on the cross with the blood of Christ. We are to give to God what belongs to him ourselves. He says, give the coin to Caesar. Give yourself to God. We can pay taxes to Caesar. We don't have a Caesar, but that represents government here. We can pay our taxes. We should. But we are not to worship Caesar. You and I do not belong to Caesar. We belong to God. Caesar represents any human government. There are governments and rulers who blatantly seek the worship of their people, as Caesar did. He claimed to be a son of God. Jesus is the son of God. Some set themselves up to be gods. Others aren't so blatant. But any time any human being or government seeks or demands unconditional acceptance of their agenda or their role, whether the demand is blatant or subtle, that government is usurping a position and a role that belongs to God alone. We do not worship our country. We do not worship our government. Our commitment to Christ outweighs them all. And we allow him to set our agenda and challenge our views. Even if that challenge causes us sometimes to go against our preferred party in some areas. That's what it means for Christ to reign supreme in our lives. And as followers of Christ, you and I, those of us who follow Christ, we are twice his. He has two claims on us. One, because he made us and he created us in his image. We bear his image. We bear his likeness. And twice, because he bought us on the cross of Christ. Psalm 100, verse 3 says, Know that the Lord, he is God. <clears throat> it is he who made us, and therefore we are his people. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We are once his because he made us. 1 Corinthians 3.23 in the New Testament says, You are Christ's and Christ is God's. We are twice his because he bought us. And that means that we place our faith and our trust and our hope in Christ above all others. It doesn't mean that we aren't engaged in human government. We are. It doesn't mean that we withdraw from the issues and the cares and the concerns of this world or from involvement in this world. We don't. We, it, it, it does mean that we don't lose our minds when things don't go our way or the way that we think they should go because we belong to Christ not Caesar. He says, give to Caesar his coin, but don't give him yourself. That is reserved for God alone. Your worship, your service, 
your loyalty above all else belong to him. And you and I, we are twice his. Mrs. Detweiler knew that she was created in the image of God. She worked at Murray Elementary as <coughs> one of the special education teachers. Her emphasis was on like reading recovery. Didn't take her students long to recognize the image of God within her, which made them feel special and loved. Even though she was a special ed teacher, the students of Murray Elementary considered it a privilege to be invited to her room. The walls of her small classroom were covered with stars made out of bright yellow construction paper and neatly written in black permanent marker on the star at the top of each row was the name of one of her students. And as soon as the student finished reading a book, no matter how much she had to help them to read that book, the title of that book was placed on another star that soon appeared directly beneath the star that had their name on it. And the more books a person read, the more stars accumulated under the name, and they could look and they could see the impact that she was having on their lives. Whenever her students finished a book, she made them feel like stars. Her ability to make her students feel special and important was a mark of the image of God shining through her. She bore the image of God. She loved her students. That was the image of God in her. She gave of herself by teaching them to read. That was the image of God in her. She believed in her students. That was the image of God in her. But even as one created in the image of God, she would be the first to say that she had her faults. There were times when she let her students down, times when she lost her patience, times when her mood affected her ability to respond enthusiastically to them. She wasn't perfect, but she'd been created in the image, in the, in the image of God. She'd been claimed as God's child through baptism and renewed each day with the gift of forgiveness. And she gave God what belonged to God by giving of herself to her students and Jesus worked through her. <clears throat> through her, through Mrs. Detweiler, God's love and acceptance and encouragement was shown to many students as they grew and matured into the people God had created, the image, uh, created them to be. That was the image of God in her. As she gave God what belonged to God, God continued to give himself to her, revealing his love again and again through the sparkle in her students' eyes. You are God's. You bear his image. When we look at one another, we see the image of God. Jesus said, give to God things that are God's. You belong to God. He's saying, give yourself to God. But before you can even respond to his call to give yourself to him, God has given himself to you. Even before you have a chance to respond to Jesus' command, Jesus goes to the cross. He goes to the cross to give to God what belongs to God. Jesus goes to the cross to give you to his Father in heaven, who then blesses you with salvation and eternal life. Jesus goes to the cross for you and gives you life. Give to God the things that are God. You are twice his. Once because he made you and because he made you, you bear his image and likeness. God intentionally put his image and his likeness on humanity in a way that he touched humanity in a way that no other part of creation was touched. There is more beauty in you than there is in the trees that adorn northern Michigan right now with beauty. Because you bear the image of God. That doesn't mean that the rest of creation doesn't have value and worth. It does. Because God made it. But he touched you and I in a special way by putting his image and his likeness in us. Jess, you bear the image of God. Ed, you bear the image of God. Claude, you bear the image of God. Elizabeth, you bear the image of God. Luke, you bear the image of God. 
Mitch, you bear the image of God. Ralph, you bear the image of God. And we all know Linda bears the image of God. <laughs> You're once his because you bear his image. Just as that coin bore Caesar's image. And you are of far more value than any coin. But you're twice his because then he bought you. With the blood of Christ, he bought you. Give to God the things that are God's, remembering that Jesus has already given himself for you. Let's pray. Loving God. I, I hope we stand in awe today of what you have done. May we give to you that which belongs to you. And that is our very selves. No matter what we do. No matter how we earn our way through this world, whether we work in construction or education or medicine or law or the ministry, whether we're still working or retired, we're not even there yet, not even working yet, still in school. May we recognize that we belong to you and nothing can change that and that we are twice yours. How incredible is that? I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.